It's just after a quarter to twelve. It's time for Music Matters with Tom Service. Today, the gift to be free, going beyond the limits of performing, composing, listening and singing. Not bad for your next 45 minutes. Que j'aime voir, cher indolente, de ton corps si beau. Baudelaire is the enfant terrible of the French poetry generation. And on the night in question, that auditory presence chimed or rhymed. This peculiar visual presence, this kind of blue light that seemed to irradiate everything for just a few moments. We'll travel to the composer Karlheinz Stockhausen's world of cosmic joy, hear the hum of the world with the writer Lawrence Kramer and sing the unbounded imagination of Baudelaire's poetry in settings from death metal to French melody. And first, we're exploding conventions with the violinist Patricia Kopachinska. A violinist... Well, she's more than that. She's a composer, an improviser, a multimedia performance maker and a ferociously communicative onstage presence. Whether she's playing Beethoven or George Crumb or making new concertos with composers from Peter Oertwersch to Michael Hirsch, which is another way of saying Patricia Kopaczynskaya is a violinist or what a violinist could be. She simultaneously redefines what a performer should do and she's returning to bigger and broader ideas of what being a musician is all about. I met Patricia Kopaczynskaya in Birmingham where she was playing Tchaikovsky and Bartok with the conductor Mirga Grajanita Tila and the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> I think there's something that uh, somebody even wrote about you recently, um, thinking about you as a musician of extremity or wildness, this kind of thing. But no living composer has ever said to you, do less. They've all said more. That's right. I think the interpreter is a very bad role we invented in this uh, hierarchy of making music. We should be as inspired as the composer himself. We are a part of this big bang of the birth. I am a part of, of the creation and the moment of, of sounding, of making it to a body of now. I am the creator in the end. Because the music they write down is just a proposal. There are people who think uh, there is a right way and a, and a wrong way. We're looking at the uh, the, the backside of Symphony Hall, uh, where you're shortly to, to, to play, a place where people are going to sit and people will come on stage wearing probably black and notes will happen and people will go home. But in other words, there, there are a lot of conventions in the world. I wanted to tell you the story. Some days ago I played in Amsterdam in the small uh, concert hall in Concertgebouw, a very um, simple recital. Yeah, we played um, Enescu sonata, Bartok sonata, Pulenk sonata. All, of course, very special things. But as you say, the tradition is sitting in our neck, like, sitting in our neck, uh, like a monster. <laughs> it is such a heavy luggage on us. I feel very acute necessity to to somehow break out of this box. And I think I, I do it. But when I'm in a concert, I'm still a musician, as you say, looking like a penguin on stage and, and playing the notes I see, yeah? And there are listeners who are very polite. They have expectations. So the most obvious thing is to, to break the expectations. My husband is a neurologist and he um, very often explains me simple things. When you put one hand on the other and, and leave it like this for hours, you don't feel it anymore. So you have to move. The perception of a human being is very simple. You just have to change something. So I started in this concert to talk to the audience. But <laughs> it's constant in Amsterdam. Yeah, but not just to talk. I, I said, uh, why do we always surprise our audience in the end of the concert, uh, <laughs> playing uh, encore? Why, why don't I play now for you an encore? 
And starting by breaking one piece after other, it became such a ridiculous tradition. I thought, why didn't I do it before? Why did I have to wait until I'm 42 years old, going through all these incredibly ridiculous conventions, like keeping the distance to the audience, being untouchable, unquestionable, perfect, which is of course not true. How can we pretend ever to be perfect? It's one of those things where it's not only what the performers do, it's, it's, it's what listeners expect of themselves. I mean, some people are going to come with you, some people might not. I have good experience with the audience. You just have to open your soul. We are naked on stage. We are completely vulnerable also. And we have to, to stand for it. We are artists. This is our job, to make ourselves vulnerable. And people who might not like it, they will not come anymore. It's, you know, we have democracy here. No, no, nobody forces them to, to come into my concert. So all we need is probably just having fun and enjoy. You know, this is what we didn't learn in conservatories. How to have fun. To have fun, <laughs> to enjoy, like children. just thinking about another kind of conversation so the, the, the collaborations that you have with living composers and there's a concerto written for you one of the many but uh, Michael Harris's concerto that is a, a, a abyssally dark piece yeah. but it, it dazzles as well I mean it, it in all the most positive senses it, it's a very uncomfortable discomforting listen it hurts it hurts it hurts You know, and I, I, I feel so strange to, to play such music because I know it hurts me, it hurts also the audience. And do we want this? But probably we need it. Well, it's like you said, it's, it's another experience of change. It's yeah, moving. It's we something. need it's to experience it. How can we understand uh, music without knowing these extreme people who, who didn't follow a any traditional convention? They, they, they are just themselves. And <laughs> once I, I, when I premiered the violin concert of Michael Hirsch, I really, I literally excused myself on stage in America. I said, please, um, just give us a chance. We will play for you this music which will hurt and you might hate it, but you for sure will never forget it. I want to speak to everyone in this audience. I want them to have an experience which they will not forget, in good and maybe also bad sense. Why not? And you know, we should forget about stage and audience. We were all all in one. In my projects in last two or three years, I, I started to like War and Chips or Bye Bye Beethoven. Yeah, and DS Ira, for example. I started to rethink completely the programming. And so this is everything involved: theatre, lighting, yeah. storytelling, yeah. voices you in many different contexts. We musicians have such a great potential. First of all, we always forget that we are not only sound-making uh, uh, bodies. People are looking at us <laughs> two hours long. We are in possession of a great power. Not even politicians have this power, if you think. We have 2,000 listeners and we are standing for two hours on stage. So you can make quite a lot of important things on this stage. If you have something to say, why, why shouldn't we do it? And so when, when we did DS Era, for example, it was a very touching project. We started this with... Was, this was a, one of the things that you were telling stories about. There was climate change, the ends of worlds, where, where we are. But as an experience through everything that was happening on stage. Right. So we started with soldier steps. You could hear it from, from a pianissimo to a crescendo, huge crescendo, to fortissimo while people came in. You also heard Okanagon of uh, Chelsea. And it's about the heart beat of the earth. After this, we started to play Bieber Battaglia, combining with George Crumb's um, Black Angels, which is about Vietnam uh, War and uh, Bieber's Battaglia. It's, it's about the everyday wars. And then we showed a video from YouTube 
showing the Aleppo, the, the dead Syrian city, nobody anymore, the, just ruins. And it was horrible. And then we played Michael Hirsch, um, the first movement of, of his violin concerto, which was so, so heartbreaking. And then we had a choir in the middle of the audience, standing up in, in, a, in the form of cross with candles, singing Antonio Lotti's uh, crucifixion. It was such an incredible moment. And in the very end, we had all metronomes, like 30 something, like in Ligeti's piece, and put them under the seat of the listeners so they, do, they would feel that they're sitting on a bomb. And this is literally our time. We are sitting on a bomb, on a ticking bomb. So this DS era was kind of a point in my life where I suddenly understood this is something what we should do. And we musicians have a duty. And it's not about playing right or wrong. Uh, all this we do since so many years, saying nothing with these pieces. Patricia Kopachinskaya, and that's the point, you know, she's not taking anything for granted in the way she performs, and in that sense I think she's a, a lesson to all of the performers out there, and to all of us listeners too, we can't and we shouldn't take any of this music for granted, we need to rethink it and reimagine what's happening. This is Music Matters here on BBC Radio 3 with me, Tom Service. More profits of musical and universal freedom to come today. Karlheinz Stockhausen's Cosmic Joy and listening to the hum of the world. And now we've the poetry of that 19th century free thinker, Charles Baudelaire, writer of Les Fleurs du Mal, The Flowers of evil, poems whose splenetic and visceral, sensual, sacrilegious imagery cut to the heart of French society in the late 1850s, and whose aftershocks are still felt today. And they're still heard as well, because Baudelaire has inspired countless musicians, and not only French chansonniers like Serge Gainsbourg. Que j'aime voir, cher indolente, de ton corps si beau. Comme une étoffe vacillante miroiter la peau Sur ta chevelure profonde so how to account for the power that composers and singers from Debussy to Diamanda Gallus, from classical to heavy metal, jazz to the avant-garde, have found and still find in Baudelaire's poems? Well, through the Baudelaire Song Project. That's how. This is a four-year-long odyssey whose fruits are all online for free for all of us to see. It's led by Professor Helen Abbott, who's a writer, researcher and singer, and her team on a mission to find every song setting of Baudelaire across across all genres, from the earliest settings to the very newest, including a commission for this year's Oxford Leader Festival from Cheryl Francis Hode, and we'll hear from Cheryl soon. But first, here's Helen Abbott. So why Baudelaire and how much Baudelaire has been set and how many songs have they found so far? We have got over 1,600 songs. We've got classical music, of course, and a lot of that is melodie, that kind of French art song, but some of it is sort of on the edge of opera, some of it is orchestral song. But we've also got uh, chanson, that kind of nice French tradition, and then we've got pop of all types. We've got rock, we've got rap, we've got hip-hop, we've got metal of all kinds of genres and lots of languages as well which surprised us we didn't set out to find out how many translated song versions of Baudelaire there were but it turns out there's quite a lot time takes a cigarette puts it in your mouth you pull on your finger then another finger then a cigarette what is it about Baudelaire, the, well, who he was, and of, and of course the, the poems themselves. 19th century Paris, a time of uh, social, political and everything else change, which he seems to be voicing in some very particular way, which has attracted all kinds of musicians. It's as if Baudelaire is the enfant terrible of the French poetry generation. He's lived through uh, upheaval after upheaval. French life has gone from having 
monarchs to emperors, back to monarchies again. As a result, Paris as a city has changed massively and slums are being knocked down. They're building new stuff in front of the Louvre. They're building new styles of building. And that's when Baudelaire's writing. He's seeing all around him new types of people living and inhabiting the city. And he is so much of a city poet. When he writes about Paris and people, he's writing about human experience. And he's writing about it with a bit of grit and a bit of edge. And that's what people still like today. We know that in 1970s Britain, for example, there are a ton of rock artists who suddenly go, Baudelaire, yeah, enfant terrible, he's got this grit. We get David Bowie being inspired by him. And we get the Rolling Stones being inspired by him. And we also get a, a sort of an up-and-coming at the time generation of classical composers being inspired by him. We get Richard Rodney Bennett, we get Elizabeth Lutyens, uh, we also get Jonathan Harvey, all having a go at Baudelaire in completely different ways, but in those different ways they are all being experimental. He has given us this sort of gift of poetry which has so many layers to it that you can play around. It's experimenter's kind of heaven. Helen Abbott. François Atlas is the nom de plume of the French singer François Marie, whose album On les Fleurs de Mal came out at the end of last year. And for François, this was a creative project that sparked connections across the centuries, from the Paris of the 21st century to the turmoil of the 1850s and 60s. So what musical fuel did he find in Baudelaire's poems when he came to work with them? De ce terrible Tel que jamais mortel n'en vit I discovered the rhythm in it and the way one syllable calls on to another one is very musical. It's like really, really simple to put into music. And I worked really instin instinctively. I just had the, the book open on my lap and I was just like pick, turning the pages and like picking the poems that would work well with simple pops chords on the guitar. So it, it was very instinctive. I wonder if there's a specifically Parisian uh, element as well, you know, the Paris that he's in, in a way protesting against uh, in, yes. in the 1850s, 1860s and today's Paris. I try to tune to that as well because it's always quite disconcerting moving to a new city and you need some kind of landmarks. And for me, using Baudelaire as a, as a way to approach beauty through grittiness and beauty through darkness was a good way to move into like a city where misery is quite, is quite strong, you know, like when you walk around you can see lots of people sleeping on the pavement and like lots of homeless. So at least, yes, coming to Paris and like being contrived by um, financial aspects, living cheaply, I, I had a, a way to hold on to some kind of ideal, idealism and beauty through uh, Baudelaire's poems. Uh, do, do you have favorite moments from the album? I think the last track only Rêve like Parisien. pure, yes, Parisien. Rêve Parisian, Parisian Dreams, also because it deals with uh, being in Paris and how mineral the city is and how uh, symmetrical and beautiful the buildings can be, but at the same time you feel kind of lost sometimes. So, how to work with Baudelaire for the very first time as a composer? Cheryl Francis Hode is writing a new version of Baudelaire's poem, The Carcass, which is a spectacularly and gorily sensual creation that's never been heard in a classical context before. And Cheryl's at the very start of her creative process. So I have no concrete ideas at all at the moment. I'm going to be setting a poem called A Carcass. Rappelez-vous l'objet que nous vîmes, mon âme. Recall the object which we saw that fair, sweet summer morn. At a turn in the path, a foul carcass on a gravel strewn bed. Which is, according to Helen, one of Baudelaire's goriest poems that uh, compares his lover to a rotting corpse that they come across whilst out on a walk. And it's just full of this 
incredibly, um, you know, visceral imagery, maggots sort of writhing away in flesh, um, the, 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 the stench, it, it leaps off the page at you and and it just gives you musical ideas straight away. The lines like the blowflies were buzzing around that putrid belly. I mean, that just suggests immediate, gnarly, um, disgusting sort of piano writing. Um, and, you know, it's contrasted with sort of lines that, you know, very, very beautiful as well. He, he says, um, he says, star of my eyes, sunlight of my being, you, my angel and my passion. So beauty and the disgustingness of it. It's, it's all textures for me at the moment. Um, there's an, you know, there's another line about sort of oozing, disgusting, smelly sort of, you know, things that happen when a, when a carcass, you know, returns to the earth. The sort of disgusting, slimy legatos that I'll try and get out of the singer and the piano. I think it's, it's, just, it's just really exciting. Are there particular favourites of yours still that you have as a singer, Helen, as well, the things you keep coming back to? As a singer, it's always a Dupark one. It's not the famous Dupark one. The famous Dupark one is L'Invitation au Voyage, but it's the other one, it's La Vie Antérieure. Um, which is a past life, a former life. It's all it's nostalgia, real sort of sense of looking back on a life. Um, I'm still young, but I still I still enjoy that sense of, of kind of the grandeur of the world and that there's something going on in, in, in our human existence. Helen Abbott. And you can find the Baudelaire Song Project and all of its resources for free online. Cheryl Francis Hode's setting of The Carcass will be premiered at the Oxford Leader Festival on the 11th of October. And Francois Atlas's album Les Fleurs du Mal is out now. A new way to hear the world, a new philosophy of listening from the writer Lawrence Kramer coming up, but now a journey to the star Sirius with the composer Karlheinz Stockhausen. Well, even if we don't make it to the stars in the next few minutes with Karl Heinz, where Stockhausen said he came from and to whose celestial bosom he returned when he died in 2007, the scale and ambition of his music, crazy, wild, generous and egotistical, and especially his cycle of seven operas, Licht, Light, one for each day of the week. It's all radiating across Europe this spring at the South Bank Centre in London with performances of Donnerstag, Thursday, as part of their festival of his music and legacy called Cosmic Prophet, and in Holland, where the largest ever suite of performances from Licht is soon to take place. But Stockhausen's legacy is a strong yet fragile phenomenon. He was in control of his performances as much as possible when he was alive, and without him, it's in the hands of his closest friends, partners and collaborators, especially his two companions, the flautist Katinka Paspia and clarinetist Suzanne Stevens. We spoke to them both, and first here's Katinka. Why does she think that Stockhausen seems to speak more and more powerfully to today's audiences and performers? Perhaps the world feels more free now to tackle these difficult pieces because they have the feeling Stockhouse is not looking over their shoulders. <laughs> but um, the essence is the same, huh? So I think they feel exactly what we felt when practicing this music and rehearsing it and performing it. It's, yeah, feeling this incredible beauty. This Stockhausen called it alien beauty. It's, uh, it's not emotional music like a normal opera world or music of the past. It's, uh, it's all about new feelings and beautiful feelings, so nothing ugly. And I think that's exactly what we need today in today's world now. And that's all... Also, what makes the musicians who work on this work so happy. Now, during rehearsals, they, huh. they call me the bad cop because <laughs> I'm always, <laughs> always correcting and perhaps I'm even more precise uh, than Stockhausen uh, because <laughs> I want the music to be really perfect. It's possible, but Stockhausen did have less uh, patience. So I have more patience uh, with especially young students. Katinka Pasphere, 
So how does Suzanne Stevens think of what she needs to do to continue Stockhausen's legacy? Philanx was a person who had a, a very clear vision. He was the control maniac. He basically felt it was his responsibility that what he composed be performed according to the way he had notated it, the way he had received the inspiration. So he often during rehearsals would kind of consider the, his own scores as if they were written by somebody else. And he tried very much to be very exact in the notation so we as interpreters know what to do. And that made it quite uh, easy. And this is why he spent so much time making his scores so that an interpreter can see what he meant. Now, interpretation for me um, means... It starts with the perfection of realizing the musical notation, which means you still have a lot of freedom, uh, and you put your personality into this, uh, the notation. So a big misunderstanding about Karl Heinz's music is that people think there's no room for interpretation, and that's simply not true, because I have so many students who... I put together sometimes in a piece like a little harlequin or something. Every human being brings something new into a piece. And this is why we notice uh, that this music is opening up a completely young generation looking for something special, which uh, is awakened by these completely innovative things that you find in Stockhausen, electronic music and his instrumental music, which usually involves movement at the same time. All of these things are fascinating for young people, which means we have a generation of young people who feel liberated from what they're expected in a classic training, for instance. I mean, Karl Heinz wrote a beautiful text once about the name of conservatory should be changed into exploratories. But imagine if you were a composer making your own version of Stockhausen's music and ideas. Well, that's the epic task that Darren Cunningham, a.k.a. actress, has embarked on in London. He's made his own world parliament, which is one of the movements from Stockhausen's Donnerstag aus Licht. Darren's own version includes artificial intelligence and electronics, a chamber choir and a solo pianist, and some very special interviews, as you'll hear from him. And Darren Cunningham has got a longer history with Stockhausen and his music, even than this commission, going back a couple of decades to his student days. You know, I, I won't lie, I wasn't the best student. I, I, you know, my attendance could have been a lot better, but, I mean, at that time I was much more interested in just just making my music, getting on the drum machines and actually just trying to teach myself a lot of things, you know. But I went to enough tutorials and, and lectures to be in class one day and it was mentioned that we were doing basically a day trip. It was either the Royal Festival or the Barbican Centre, but I can't quite remember where it was. There was going to be a performance of Stockhausen's music and, yeah, his music came on and... I just never ever heard anything like it before. Was it the electronic stuff or instrumental? It was it was electronic. It was the one basically where it sounds like it's like it's a radio tuning frequency ah, okay. and the sounds okay. are coming. Did it then immediately become something you think, well, I want to make something similar or uh, uh, that, that's the sound world which I want to dive into as well? It was just the audacity of it. It was just the simple audacity of it and how far it removed me from what I thought music was and ought to be. The, the first thought that I had was wouldn't it be interesting, wouldn't it be cool to interview real members of parliament and um, we're going through very tenuous strange political times at the moment the you know the atmosphere politically is difficult and maybe it's an opportunity to filter some of that into a piece which seems ready made to pick up the the, the political debris so because in, in Stockhausen's developed parliament the, 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 there is the conversation about about love but this is what you've done and you've asked members of the British parliament and the Dutch parliament the, the simple question yeah. what what is love I'm not sure I can... 
can summarize what the Parliament has presented or present a policy that can be the principal legislation or no. Sometimes you wonder, of course, there are different degrees of love, love between women and women, between men and men. Everyone is allowed to be as they are. Yeah, well, I mean, you think it might be a a simple question, but it really isn't. And putting it through the lens of politics was interesting and fascinating for me. Were you surprised by what what the politicians gave you? They're very different. Like the UK versus the the Dutch, very very different because obviously the climate in the UK was was fever pitch. I mean, at the time that we were doing the recordings, there was deadlock essentially. There seemed no way out of the situation that was going on in the Houses of Parliament at that time, and um, it just seems um, like this piece was destined for this particular moment. Literature, the arts, daily life. It's all about love. There's, there's a lot of moving parts. There's going to be aspects of a computer similar to sort of HAL in an, in a space odyssey that is basically spitting out the the, the, the the debate. But because we're using quadraphonic speaker systems, they're going to be coming out of different speakers. All so, right, so it's all around. There's, the, yeah, there's, a, there's, around a, there's, a, there's a lot going on in the piece. Uh, so that's... That's the way that I've tried to sort of allude to what Stockhausen's trying to do within his piece, which is not have anything that's static, try to touch on some of his um, philosophies from that perspective. How inspirational do you feel a a figure he has been for you uh, in terms of this piece, but maybe also just in general as a... As an artist who saw himself, and indeed many people, it's up to them how they see him, but you know, he's a, he's a, he's a guy on a cosmic scale. I love it when you get a sense of the character in the music, despite what the perception of him might be. And there's obviously, um, he's obviously a funny guy, and he's obviously someone who enjoyed, enjoyed a laugh, despite the fact that he was extremely meticulous about um, his ideas. Darren Cunningham, a.k.a. Actress. Stockhausen's ever-present resonance remade in his world parliament. So is the world becoming more like Stockhausen's creative universe, or vice versa? Here's Katinka Pasvir again. So Stockhausen always said, I have to wait 40 years and then the world start to understand. And we see that now all the early works are now... Uh, acknowledged masterworks and Licht is now 30 years old and suddenly the world catches up so um, it just needed time One of the essences of Licht Light is the composition, the description and the embodiment of a a spirituality which is both nothing to do with religion and also Mm. a sort of summation of the world's religious feeling Uh, really just why Mm. that feels important Right now. So Licht deals with problems and issues uh, of whole mankind. So it's about birth, it's about war, it's about temptation, uh, learning, union, cooperation. So everyone can uh, relate to these things. And in the music, it always gives hope. It gives uh, always a solution, a musical solution. So it's not about real philosophy, but one feels uplifted after each scene of light, musically uplifted, also spiritually uplifted. Uh, Katika, just what's your own relationship with Stockhausen, the the person now? Ah, I miss him. <laughs> so my relation with Stockhausen is the same. So I love the person, I love the music, and it's like, is if he's here still, and I think he would be happy. I'm doing the job now because he never would have given six months of his life to again rehearse this music. So he would have uh, been composing something quite new. Katinka Pasvir, 
And that performance of Actresses World Parliament is at South Bank Centre in London on the 14th of May. We'll be broadcasting it right here on BBC Radio 3 on the new music show. And the performances of the whole of Donnerstag from Stockhausen's Licht are on the 21st and 22nd. And Aus Licht is at the Holland Festival. Performances from the 31st of May until the 10th of June. Now, can you hear it? Not my voice, but what's behind it. I mean, if you think there's anything there, of course. But remember what Patricia Kopaczynskaya told us earlier about the motivation behind her collaboration with composers and the way she challenges conventions. She's listening not only to sounds, but what drives them, what's underneath them. Well, that thought is an upbeat to our listening to the author Lawrence Kramer, whose new book builds on a lifetime of writing about music that puts sound together with ideas in mind-expanding ways. The new book is called The Hum of the World. It's a philosophy of listening that Lawrence has come up with, the idea of sound being fundamental to life, and it's based on a new quality that Lawrence Kramer calls the Audible. That's the word audible with an extra A in it. Audible. Well, you hear what he thinks it means soon. It's all around us. We just have to tune into it. So here's Lawrence Kramer. Look, we'll get to audiability soon and how sound is the necessary background for the existence of all life. There's a lot going on in the next eight minutes or so, but let's start with sound, music and 18th century automata. Naturally. A number of years ago, I was working on a paper, and it was about sound and music and artificial life in the Enlightenment. People who have studied this always tend to go back to one very uh, critical development. In 1737, when a French inventor named Jacques Van Rosson created three androids, Androids in the early 18th century. Yes. These, these were automata which would seem to speak for themselves in some way or be able to produce sound on their own, right? That's exactly right. And the one that was most remarkable in that respect was a life-sized figure of a flute player. This flute player could, in effect, be programmed to produce any of 12 tunes on his flute. It actually played the flute with air. <laughs> Why, I ask myself, in order to give the impression of life, create an automaton that plays the flute? Why music? Why sound? So I began to investigate it, and I discovered, or believe I discovered, that at least since late classical times to the present day, there is a whole history of understanding of a fundamental connection between the perception of the condition of being alive and the production of sound. So sound is the measure of life. And the book takes off from that basic observation and ramifies it in as many directions as I could think of. There is a word in English, audible. <laughs> the <laughs> idea of something that's, that we can perceive uh, through the mechanisms of our hearing or vibration perception, let's put it like that. Um, but you put an A in there, so the word is audible. Uh, and you, you sum it up here relatively early on in the book. The audible is the sound of the wave before it breaks. Now listen, could you just extrapolate from that what that means? But what is the audible? I, I did need this one word. The audible is the hum of the world. So it refers to the fundamental background to all sense perception. And it turns out that that floating surface on which sense perception occurs, that background is auditory. So it is the thing on which audibility rests. Suddenly we simply become aware of our embeddedness in the world through our relationship to this kind of ground tone, this fundamental sound. Some, some examples of, of that range? Yes, well, this is something that happened to me on one occasion when I was out at night with my dog. So there are times when where I live, which is on a hilltop, remote from any pollution of light and stuff like that, that the air around one assumes a kind of extraordinary quietness. In that quietness, one can hear this presence. And on the night in question, that auditory presence chimed or rhymed or reinforced this peculiar 
visual presence, this kind of blue light that seemed to irradiate everything for just a few moments. So, I mean, it kind of came to me as a proof of the thing that I was talking about, because there I was, I was hearing it. Uh, really, really quite an extraordinary thing. How is music privileged here? Can we hear the sounds that music makes? Can we access the quality of the audible? Oh, we can indeed. There are, starting in the late 18th century and going on through the present day, lots of musical compositions which, in some ways, try to make the audible audible. In the opening movement of Beethoven's so-called Tempest Sonata, towards the end of that movement, there are some interruptions and when the music comes to a stop, you hear very, very quietly a single melodic line, unaccompanied, played you know, slowly and expressively with a pedal down, so that as the sound continues, a kind of vibratory hum emerges around the sound. Through the melody, you hear the background assuming dimension and sensory quality. And then the pedal is released and the music goes on. Mm. Now, this happens twice, and the second time it happens more profoundly than the first time, because the second time the music is more dissonant. So what the pedal is collecting is not just the sounds of harmony, but also the sounds of what might in another context be disharmony, but in this context becomes a kind of present, immediate feeling of transcendence, but transcendence towards nothing in particular. It's one of those amazing holes. You know, you, you do you feel like that you're seeing behind the canvas through Alice in Wonder, whatever it might be. But in your terms, Lawrence Kramer, it's this quality of the audible, the, the, the hum of the world from which all of this comes. I'm hoping that by drawing attention to uh, the richness, the complexity, and the prevalence of this phenomenon, people can ask more acute questions about what their experience means, particularly in an era in which we are experiencing a fundamental transformation in the very nature of consciousness. The digital revolution uh, has changed the different ways in which we pay attention to such an extent that the form of awareness, the form of cognition, is something which is not properly called consciousness at all. The question that I try to pose, and it's both um, a philosophical question and a musical question and an ethical question is, how much do we want to hold on to consciousness? Do we want to continue with it? And if we do, how do we? Really, this is an ethical, fundamental, social, political importance that you're attaching to the idea of this way of perceiving sound. This, way, this as you say in the subtitle of the book, this philosophy of listening. Yeah, that's why it's subtitled The Philosophy of Listening. Ultimately, the questions raised by the book are about the future of our sense of embodied life in the world. Lawrence Kramer, whose new book, The Hum of the World, A Philosophy of Listening, is out now from University of California Press. And just uh, another place that you can hear the audible, audibly, the ends of concerts, the silences before the applause starts, the audible is all around us. Which completes this week's journey into the limitless regions of our hearing and our listening. Music Matters was presented today by me, Tom Service, and produced by Marie Claire Doris. Next week, actually, you know what? We're crossing boundaries then too with the pianist Stephen Kovacevic, the composer Thomas Ades, the music of Howard Skempton, and Esmeralda Conde Ruiz's grandmother. The words of 60 grandmothers from all over the world turned into a grand new choral piece. All of that next time.